One of the more interesting concepts that I run into in software engineering is the concept of streams. These can be somewhat difficult to understand. So let's mash on that. Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of the ASP.NET Monsters. In today's episode, we're going to do a little introduction to the concept of streams. Um, so this is really with an eye to do a couple of episodes around streams and some of the interesting technologies that we see around that. Uh, but before we got into any of those technologies, I thought it would be good to kind of give people a gentle introduction to streams. So tell me, Simon, what's so complicated about streams? They're just tiny rivers? The... Yeah, basically, it's just like a river that is scaled down. Um, in my mind, it's a little bit more idyllic than a river, a little bit less polluted, has more otters in it uh, than you would find kind of like in a standard river. Um, certainly something that we see more in storybooks. Uh, but for our purposes, streams are uh, basically just a collection in time of events that have occurred in the system or in the world, uh, and they provide us a way of working with them. Now, I think we've done probably some episodes in the past that have touched on streaming technologies. Uh, we have done stuff with reactive, uh, like reactive extensions, um, and I'm sure we've done some other topics in there over the years, um, but I wanted to get started, kind of refresh again from the beginning. So uh, to start off with, I want to talk about what these events are that exist in streams. Now, the really helpful thing about PowerPoint here is that it lets me see the slide coming up so I can see that there is a typo in the title, but I can't do anything about it. Um, so we'll just keep going here. Uh, so that should be what is an event and not what's an event. Uh, but basically an event is just something that has happened inside of the system. Uh, now this could be as simple as somebody has logged into the system uh, where we might have the name of the event, is it user logged in, who it is it logged in, and at what time they logged in. Uh, we might also have something like uh, the traditional sample of a bank transfer, right? If you're moving money between two different bank accounts, so you have a source and destination, how much you're transferring, uh, and you send that out there. Uh, so basically, events are things that are like always happening inside of your system. Uh, they hold deltas from the way that the world was before. So if we go back to Take a look at this one here, which is a bank account example. We don't know what the initial balance of the bank account is. We don't know what the ending account balance is, but we know that there's been this transfer, this movement of money between two different bank accounts. Um, so in theory, if we went back to the beginning of time and we took a look at all the events that had ever occurred on some object, then we would be able to figure out what the current state of that object is by just replaying all of those events and applying them one on top of the other. So adding and subtracting money from bank accounts uh, until we end up with what the current state of the world is. Um, and I feel like there's like a philosophical prime mover question related to this, that um, if you know the location of all the particles in the universe, at any point in time, then you can predict the future. Uh, fortunately, our problem set is a little bit smaller than the universe and a little bit uh, easier because we don't have any sort of weird quantum effects, hopefully, in our system. Uh, but it does mean that we can go back and figure out kind of what's happening right now based on all the things that have happened in the past. Um, do, you, then, do these events usually have a point in time associated with them? Yes, typically they'll have a point in time associated with them. So it means that you can replay the events, not just up to right now, but up to an arbitrary point in time in the past. So if you needed to know what is the state of the system on last Thursday at 3 p.m., then you can replay all the events up until last Thursday at 3 p.m. And then you will know what the state of the system is. Um, so for those purposes, it is super useful. Right? Like one of the 
things that I fight against on what feels like a daily basis, but it's probably like once a year, is the inclusion of updated and changed and created dates on records in a database. Mm -hmm. uh, because those are frustrating because I know that that record was updated last week, but I couldn't tell you what changed on it or who changed it or why they changed it or what the record looked like before that time. Whereas if I had a stream of events, it's very easy for me to replay the stream of events and see what the change was that occurred at that time. Um, so that's one of the nice things about events. Uh, the other couple of things about it is that these can usually be easily parallelized and distributed. So typically the events that happen inside of your system happen to an object or an entity inside of your system. So if you need to replay a bunch of events that happened all throughout your system, chances are it's pretty easy to parallelize it and kind of split those events up so that one machine or one process is responsible for understanding the state of one particular entity, uh, as opposed to having all of the events coming into to one place. Um, so this does mean that when you're thinking about events, you need to think of them in a more granular way than you would the entire system, because you want to see like, hey, what are all the events that happened to the user named Dave, as opposed to what are all the events that happened to users in my system? Uh, and you can certainly take that approach, um, but if there's a lot of events, it tends to be more difficult to bring your state up to date with those events. Uh, and then the other thing to, to observe is that once an event has occurred, it can't be changed. Like there's no rewriting history. We can't go back in time and make events happen in a different way or in a different order. That's just the way that they happen. So a lot of times the systems that you see that are event driven um, will use kind of write only databases so that you can't go back and update those databases at a later point in time. That's just the way it is. Um, and if you need to make a change, then you end up using a compensating event to change that. Um, so there's lots of places that you would see this sort of thing in real life. Uh, accounting systems are a great example of that. So if you've ever done any double entry bookkeeping, you know that if you do make a change, then you have to go and write like a new journal entry to, to make that change at some later date and then attach back interpretation and all of that sort of thing so that people can see what has happened in the system and it gives them confidence. Um, but some other places you might have seen this in the real world of places like the Windows Event Viewer uh, is just a big series of events that have happened in your system. Uh, generalizing that out, log files and logs tend to be write only sorts of data sources. You can't go and change a log after it's happened. Um, Audit tables and databases are another place that you might see this thing where you just write records every time a record in the database changes, and then you can go back and read that and get an idea of what's changed in the database. Um, and then something like all the commit logs inside of Git would be another place that you might see this. Uh, so there's a lot of places that these sorts of things can fit in to software systems. Uh, anything to do with banking or finance is a brilliant place to use these sorts of systems. So you can stream a bunch of events and replay them as you need to. Uh, you can see where people have transferred money and brought money in and who did it and when and why and what the state of the system was beforehand. Uh, medical software is another great example of this. So if you think of something like the chart that somebody has by their bedside when they're in hospital, uh, that's basically an event stream that says, you know, like three o'clock, we gave them Tylenol, 3.30, we cleaned out the bedpan, so on and so forth. Um, bedpan cleaning out end up on a chart? Probably, we'll assume so. Um, so you end up with this like stream of events there too. Uh, anything that is doing event sourcing, uh, so this is the same idea that we talked about a little bit earlier, where to figure out the current state of an object in the system, you just replay all the events that have ever occurred to that system, uh, and then you can figure out the current state of it. And then there's lots of places in systems where you want to do kind of distribution of messages in general, uh, and those can go across a bunch of different topics inside of streams across an entire system. Um, so I really like eventing. I think it's a very important concept in software, and I think it's one that is missed 
in the designs of like 99% of the software that I see out there, but it makes stuff a lot easier and a lot more auditable in the long run. So this is really just the, the first topic, I think, in eventing. We're going to continue to to push forward on this and look at a couple of different systems out there that do eventing. Um, so I think, and I'm still kind of planning this series out a little bit in the back of my mind, but we're going to definitely look at Kafka, and we're probably going to take a look at the new event streams that exist inside of Redis, uh, which are a little bit easier to use, I think, a little bit easier to get started with. Uh, so we will continue on with that in future episodes. Cool. So if you, if my friendly users, can remember to like, comment, and share, then we'll see everybody on next week's episode. Bye. Bye.